Right, everybody, everybody, man. I got a smooth dude on the channel today. He won them park rangers. He won them guys that be directing <laughs> things in that history segment of America. And you're going to like what he got to say. You know who I am. I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm a, I'm a guy who's trying to do something special to keep Black history alive on this channel called Strong Inspirations. And you know, I named it that because uh, part of the aim is to inspire you strongly. Where I come up with some questions of these experts, these nice people, these people who have a career of preserving history and telling the story correctly. That's what my guest does on a daily basis. He gives you the story straight, no chasing. I'm so excited to, that, that, that he's on the channel. Let me tell you folks, I've been thinking about it. And, 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 and what happened was we had a little uh, mix up on our timing. I called the guy, he said, I'm sitting here. I said, man, can you do it? He says, I can and I'm exuberant. <laughs> I'm happy to get y'all to hear what he got to say. Watch out. Now, you know, I want you to do a few things. I'm gonna tell you again, it, uh, hit the subscribe button on the channel, it's free. Hit the like button on this video. My man gonna blow your mind. Watch out, he got a shirt and tie on. He <laughs> put that on for you, my friends. And he got a patch on his shoulder. And uh, hit the uh, notifications bell. So when the videos come up and I'm putting four or five videos up a week, my friends, you watching me, you tuning in. And then tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep this to yourself. It don't make sense. Don't be sitting in the, uh, in the barbershop saying, hey, man, let me tell you what I heard. And don't tell them where you heard it. Come on, sisters. Don't be sitting in that beauty salon. And I know you're there for hours and whatnot. And you all of a sudden say, hey, God, God let me show you all a little some of this, what I've heard. And then don't tell them where you heard it at. Come on, don't do that. Let everybody know some of this. Let it flow. The train has left the station, my friends, and good things are happening here. As you might know, I'm having my own festival. Little old me in Kansas City, Kansas, May 27th through the 29th. I call it Freedom Quindaro. The flyer is being designed as we speak. You, uh, I can only take a thousand of y'all, small town, and I can handle a thousand people. I'm gonna feed you and give you some juice. Now the liquor you gotta get on your own. I ain't gonna lie to you, but I got a feeling there's gonna be some moonshine nearby. <laughs> Watch <laughs> out. We're gonna party in a barn, wear your dusty blue jeans. On Friday night, we're gonna take tours of that area. And if you don't know what happened in Quindaro, Scroll down my listing and look at that video of how them slaves walked across that Missouri River to get from Missouri to Kansas, which Kansas was free. And then they told that man, you come over here, I'm shooting back. I ain't going back to them conditions. I interviewed a great, a guy whose great grandfather did that. And my man was so tight, he opened up a business and made some money to provide for his family. Check it out. Did you see the video of the guy who said they almost hung his father? Hmm. They, his grandfather rather, they had him at the tree and they let him go. Hmm. So uh, we're gonna talk about that at the festival, some of those things, but we're gonna keep it light on your head because you're gonna be so enthralled with the history that will circulate you while you're there. And it's gonna be well organized. There are gonna be people that greet you to let you know that the host hotel and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna make sure it's real. I don't want you talking about me, but saying good things because I'm doing more than one next year. You're gonna wanna come to this and then check it out. Uh, there are a few things else is happening. Um, oh my God, let me just tell you this. I got a movie out. I'm a filmmaker, my friends. 
It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. I got some stuff of some slaves that went to college. If you wonder how that happened, who was going to Cheney in 1837? out of Philadelphia. Now, they maybe they really wasn't slaves. They had never was slave, or maybe they was formerly slaves, but they was during slavery time anyway. They went to college. That's one of the things I talked about in my friend. You need to watch that. It's streaming on Amazon. I went a little bit further, and I wrote this book, Black Business Book, Get Your Copy. I'll autograph it for you. The off writers has not set in yet. <laughs> and I'm so confident that you'll learn something new that I tell you what I do. You order my book, you read the book, and if you know everything new, I give your money back. You ever had a book with a money back guarantee? <laughs> Boom, shaka locker, there it is. Might be the first of its kind. I'm that confident. And so do this, my friends. Go to my website, businessintheblack.net. My man is waiting. He's smiling. I know it. But watch out. I got one more thing, and here we go. Y'all hear me use that word strong a lot, which is the title of this channel, Strong Inspirations. I like strong. I wish I lived on Strong Street. There is a strong street in Detroit, but I don't live on it. It ain't my, you know, it just didn't happen, right? Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace, which is the introduction to my guest today. He's a strong man. Come on, brother, introduce yourself. Y'all gonna like what he about to say. Let's get it on. Thank you for coming on the channel. Hello, my name is Frank Tolan. I'm a park ranger at Tuskegee Airman National Historic Site in Tuskegee, Alabama. Told y'all gonna like this. Why we're gonna talk about the, the, the red tails and things like that. But before we do, my brother, I got to do this. I do it with all my guests. I got to talk about you for a little bit. Now, wh where were you born? Were you in that kind of thing? Uh, I was born in Tuskegee, right across uh, in uh, at Tuskegee Institute. They used to have a hospital there, John Andrew Hospital. I was born in John Andrew Hospital, grew up right across from Tuskegee Institute on uh, Montgomery Road. Okay, and so uh, let me ask you this. How did your, do you know how your family got to Tuskegee or is that, uh, is that where the enslavement might have happened or what? No, my, my grandfather was from Virginia. My, my uh, grandmother on my mother's side was from a uh, little town known as Camp Hill, Alabama. Okay. After slavery, my great grandfather was became a property owner in uh, Camp Hill, Alabama. He had a large farm. Oh, really? And uh, he was an associate of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington used to stay at my great grandfather's house when he would when he was up that way. And uh, he tried to get my great grandfather to come to Tuskegee and and uh, teach, but. Uh, my great grandfather just bought this piece of property and didn't want to leave it. So what he did instead is he sent my grandmother here to Tuskegee to school. Uh, and that's where she met my grandfather. I love it. Okay, well, let me add that. This is a good story here, man. We're going to go on this for a minute, bro. <laughs> you got royalty in your family, man. We got to talk yeah. about it. <laughs> How did he get the uh, have the money to buy the land and and, and you that, know you know that that I'm not certain of. Um, I know that he had was born into slavery. Okay, but after slavery, he had uh, he was able to build up enough money to buy the land. Uh, and it was a large piece of property, and he was pretty successful for you know a black man in the in the early 1900s. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. But uh, So was he a farmer or something? Is that he, what he, he was, did with the he land? He was a farmer. He was a farmer. Um, now, my grandmother, uh, she came here to Tuskegee. She she had a degree, uh, graduated with a degree in home, ec home economics, and then later went to Pearl College. Uh, with uh, Annie Tunbow Malone. And, really? Yeah, and learned how to become a hairdresser. And she 
opened her own business here back here in Tuskegee as a hairdresser. Oh man, I'm loving it. Yeah. So now hold on, we're gonna stay on this just a tad bit, man. We're gonna we jamming here on this note. So so okay, so now he uh he owns this land. Right. Did have have you been to the land? When I was young. Uh now years later, like in the 70s, uh it was a large family. It was a whole whole bunch of sons and daughters, close to 20 of them, actually. <laughs> Two different wives. Mm -hmm. uh, from the first wife, he had about 10 children. And from the second wife, he had close to 10 children. I don't think all of them survived, though, you know, past childhood. You know, back in those days, he had all kinds of childhood diseases that sometimes took children uh, mm -hmm. out. And... Uh, so, but, but you say the land is still in your family, though. It's it's not still in the family. Oh, back it's not. The, okay, somebody back sold the, it. Whatever. Back in the seventies, um, there was a dispute between uh, my grandmother and a couple of her brothers who wanted to keep the land, and but the majority had moved away from the land. They had moved to detroit or new york or chicago and other places like that mm -hmm. and they weren't interested in the land back in alabama yeah i got you you know how that goes yeah um, so now uh because there he were was more of them that wanted to sell they wanted to they wanted to keep it so yeah <laughs> yeah now because he was an astute uh guy like that he wasn't uh um uh, was he uh uh some uh, okay but he knew booker t uh Booker T. Washington. Yes. So, I mean, he was running with high company with Booker T. He was. He was. And, and uh, actually, when my grandmother came here to school, uh, she used to deliver mail. And one of the professors she delivered mail to was Dr. Carver. Dr. Who? Dr. Uh, George Washington Carver. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Carver gave her some plants that are still in her yard here in Tuskegee. Now that land we still we still have the yes. land that house was, and uh, she has some plants there that are still there that she got from uh, Dr. Carver. Now, now did um, for them to uh, for him to uh, oh no hold on I, this is not live understandably. Uh, do you have any pictures or any uh, of any notes? Any article facts or anything in your that you? I have some pictures that were taken by um. What was the guy's name? P. H. Polk. Uh, P. H. Polk was a noted black photographer. Uh, some of his pictures have been shown in galleries in New York and other places. He was the official photographer for Tuskegee Institute. Oh, really? And, okay. Uh, he took some pictures of members of my family, including my mom when she was a child, um, that, I, that I understand was on display in a gallery in New York. Uh, the picture's called Little Girl with Curl, and that's my <laughs> okay. That's my mom when she was a little girl. Okay, I love it. And my grandfather, Malachi Morse, was a classmate of P.H. Pope. He was one of the persons who taught P.H. Polk into becoming a photographer. Okay. P.H. Polk originally came to Tuskegee. He wanted to be a fine artist. You know, okay. Painter, you know, portrait painter. Oh, really? But at that time, photography was, you know, the new thing. And my grandfather convinced him that uh, becoming a photographer would be more practical. <laughs> right, sure, sure, sure. Than, be, than being a fine artist, because uh, he teased him and said, "Pope, don't you know artists don't make any money until after they did?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which back then was pretty much true, especially if you were African American. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, is so, there anything um, uh, in the news? Like, do you wouldn't happen to have a newspaper clipping or, or any story about your grandfather or anything like that? That I'm not certain of. Okay. Um, How about some this? The, some, some of the information was lost 
Okay. Uh, when my grandmother, as she got older, she had Alzheimer's. Okay. So some of what she was saying, you're not sure of. Yeah, yeah. Whether I it was you. right, whether it was accurate or whether it was partially in her mind. Or yeah, I wrong. got you. Yeah. Now, so so um uh the uh the house that they had, okay, so he got a he got some money. Yeah, it, some money. It, it, <laughs> when you have money in those days, what does that translate to? If you can understand, you follow my question. It can make you a target. That, oh really? <laughs> you know, like uh like the black people who were successful at uh Greenwood and uh in Oklahoma. Right. You know, when you're when you're uh successful like that, um in those days that was an affront to white supremacy. Uh, you don't have a story of them coming after him, do you? Uh, from what I understand, the Night Riders did come by the house, but my great grandmother, um, she was part Native American. I understand, and she knew you know, how to heal and and whatnot with herbs, so people didn't mess with her too much. <laughs> okay, because the herbs that heal that. They're also some that can, you know, heal. Mm. <laughs> so, the, so then you, so what you're saying is then from there, they encouraged education, and yeah. then what, and 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 was able to go to Tuskegee. How did how what is Tuskegee standing in that community? Uh, uh, you follow up on my a, question. Yeah, Tuskegee had a very high standard, uh, very high standing all across the uh, country. Uh, especially uh, among African Americans, that was Booker T. Washington School. You know, if you if you went to Booker T. Washington School, it gave you a certain amount of prestige. Okay. Just for having come through that uh, school. Um, now, on my father's side, he was from South Carolina, a little town called Newberry. Um, when he was when he graduated high school, he considered coming to Tuskegee, but my grandmother on his mother my grandmother was worried about him coming to alabama because of things that had happened like you know the scottsboro boy case in uh, alabama and, and my father was kind of hot tempered back in those days in terms of uh not putting up with racism uh she was worried that if he came further south than south carolina which was bad enough that he might wind up getting, you know, yeah, benched. <laughs> right. So she talked him out of coming to Tuskegee as a student, and instead he went to South Carolina State until he got drafted into the military for World War II. And after that, when he finished his education, he came to Tuskegee as a professor. Uh, so now, what is Tuskegee's? Uh, for I don't know better word lack of uh, I mean claim of claim to fame it was it uh, was it an agricultural school was it a business school it was uh, home it economics was known, or what it was known for trades uh, it was agriculture they also had uh, brick masonry and uh, uh, home economics they had a good business school later on they had uh, a real an excellent uh, Veterinary medicine school which still do, um, but it was it was more for technical education. Okay. At that time, later on, they spread out into other areas like you know liberal arts and things of that nature. Mm. But uh, back in at the beginning, it was known for its trades. Where is Tuskegee, uh, the school located in the city? Is it like downtown in the rural no, area? No, no, it's not downtown. It's um, Tuskegee uh, kind of has like its own community around it. Um, the land that Booker T. Washington built on had once been a large plantation. Really? In the area where, where a fire had taken place. And that's why he was able to buy the land for cheap. 
Um, it had had a large uh, plantation on it that had burned down, but the, the land around it is still a large area. Uh, mm. And uh, eventually he sold parcels of that land to uh, African-Americans in the area, you know, to build houses and businesses and whatnot. At the time the Tuskegee Airmen were here, they had a thriving uh, business area around uh, Tuskegee Institute. Now the, tu the Tuskegee Airmen would generally not go downtown. Downtown is where you are most likely to run into problems with the local white community, mm. which at that time was still in power uh, in the city. Uh, okay, that, let, let, before we get to that the didn't change Airmen, until like the late sixties. Okay, before we get Tuskegee Airmen, let, let me just get a couple more. We're gonna that this will lead into that. Okay, Booker T. He had a home there. Yes, he did on the property. Yeah, it was the Oaks. It was it was built uh, by the students. It's called the Oaks, and, and the Oaks is still there. It's part of the National Park Service uh, Tuskegee Institute. Okay. And we're, one that, of the, we're one of the few cities that has two national parks within the same, you know. Oh, really? Within the city limits. What, what is Tuskegee the- Tuskegee Airmen, and we got, yeah. and we have Tuskegee Institute. Where is, so now the Institute, is there a, 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 a prominent marker like a bell, you know how they have bells or something like that that, um, said, that yeah, everybody that's, knows you there. Yeah, there's there's a bell in, in Whitehall um, that rings on the hour. Uh, okay. We also have, uh, uh, of course, the the famous monument of of Booker T. Washington removing the veil of ignorance. Uh, which is in the center of, pretty much in the center of the campus. Okay. Yeah. Now, Tuskegee Institute, and then there were these offshots. There was, and when I mean by offshots, you said there was a hospital, mm -hmm. and then there was the Tuskegee Airmen. Right. Are, are they on, this, on the campus? The hospital was. It's not closed. It closed okay. uh, in the 80s. Um, now the Tuskegee Airmen, Moton Field is, it was purchased by the Institute, but it's not on the campus. The land at one time was owned by Tuskegee Institute before it got turned over to the National Park. Um, but it's headed out of town, you know, where that land is, it's a large, okay. it's a large uh, piece of land. And uh, the land where the, um, where the airport is, it's on the way out of town. As you pass out of the city limits of Tuskegee, that's the airport. What 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 is the founding of the Tuskegee Airmen? How did they begin? Now the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, we go back a little bit. Uh, after World War One, there was a infamous government study that was done, the Army War College study. In that study, even though African Americans, almost uh, 300,000 African Americans had served with honor during World War I, this study said that African Americans did not have the physical or mental capacity to make good soldiers. And it also said that African Americans were cowards. And, and we're talking about when? Wait, wait, wait. 1925 is when this study came out. Okay. And I used study in, in quotation marks. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> it wasn't really based on anything other than, you know, racist propaganda. Okay. But um, that's what the study said. It said that, that we could not learn how to do anything complicated like fly airplanes or be airplane mechanics or anything of that sort that basically the only thing black soldiers were good for was manual labor, digging ditches, digging graves, digging trenches, uh, that sort of thing. I got you. Um, now, 
President Roosevelt was running for reelection in 1940. He needed African American votes in the cities to get reelected. So, under pressure from uh, civil rights groups and black pilots that were black pilots, but they weren't black military pilots. Um, and also, at the time, there was this program called the Civilian Pilot Training Program, which existed both at white institutions as well as African American as well as six African-American colleges, including Tuskegee. It was called a civilian pilot training program and they trained civilians how to be airplane mechanic, uh, how to be airplane uh, pilots in case of a war emergency. The idea was based on something they had done in Europe before they got involved in World War II. Mm -hmm. Because even though at the time that America was not involved in the war, uh, it was pretty much known that chances were the war would spread and we'd have to get involved in some way. Okay. And that if we did, we would need pilots because airplanes would, would play a, a much more major role in World War II, okay. which they did than they did in World War I. A lawsuit that had been filed by a graduate of the civilian pilot training program, Yancey Williams, and uh, he graduated from the civilian pilot training program at Howard University. And when he tried to join the Army Air Corps, which is what existed before the Air Force, he was turned down. So he, with the help of the NAACP, filed suit against the United States government. And so they had this going on, you had the election going on, and you had pressure from civil rights group and civil rights groups in the black press. So President Roosevelt made a campaign promise. He promised that if he got reelected, he would set up a African-American uh, fighter squadron, which later became the Tuskegee Airmen. So he, he won re-election and he kept his promise. Now, what he didn't say originally with the promise is that it was gonna be segregated unit and segregated training. But okay. That's, that's what it was. Uh, the reasons why they chose Tuskegee for the program, one is you already had the successful uh, civilian pilot training program going on at Tuskegee Institute. Uh, Tuskegee is a rural area, especially back then, so you had a lot of space to build the, the various airport, the two airports that were needed. Um, Moton Field, as well as Tuskegee Army Airfield, which is, which was the Army Airfield base. Uh, once you finish training at Moton Field for primary training, after about six to nine weeks, you went on to Tuskegee Army Airfield for additional training. So those were some of the reasons. Another reason is uh, Alabama had good flying weather year round. It's not like uh, trying to start a program, say in Chicago or Detroit, where right. you don't have that many uh, days that, that are suitable to fly because you got really uh, rough winters up there. Right. Down south here in Alabama, I would say you probably have, out of 365 days, you probably got 350 days of good flying weather. Right, I got you. And uh, those are some of the reasons, but another reason was it was gonna be a segregated training. And of course, Alabama was already, especially in the 1940s, very rigidly segregated. Um, some thought that by putting the program here in Alabama, it would be more likely to fail. But they didn't count on the fact that not only was it in Alabama, it was in Tuskegee, Alabama. And the community, the African-American community in Tuskegee did not want the program to fail and help to make it successful. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me hold you up right there on this note. Mm -hmm. Who were the professors? Who was teaching them? You had... Um, Black people, white people, what? Now, at the first stage, the primary stage of training, most of your flight instructors were African-American, though you did have some white 
instructors as well. But when you moved on to Tuskegee Army Airfield, all your instructors there originally were white because that was straight up military training. And all of the Army Air Corps pilots were white until the Tuskegee Airmen came along. When, so, when, when, when they get to, oh, let me ask you this, how about this? Who, who are the students? What, what did it do? They, they come from all over America. They came they from all from over America. Area. They came from all over America. Now to become a cadet, you did have to have passed the civilian pilot training program, uh, which was the civilian uh, training where you would learn on these airplanes called J3 Piper Cubs, which uh, were pretty easy planes to learn on. They only had about 65 horsepower. Uh, so if you make a mistake in that, you have enough time to correct your mistake before your plane crashes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, once they got to Moton Field, they moved from that 65 horsepower aircraft to more advanced aircraft, the uh, uh, PT-17, which was 250 horsepower uh, biplane open cockpit uh, air, aircraft. Okay. Uh, and then of course, once you finished that and you moved on to uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield, the planes on each stage would get increasingly more uh, sophisticated. Okay. And when you got to uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield, you moved on from primary flight training to basic flight training for another uh, six to nine weeks, and then on to from that to advanced, uh, and then from advanced to transition flying. All of those stages of training took from six to nine uh, weeks. Okay. So the whole period of training from uh, primary training on through to getting your wings usually took somewhere around six months uh, to graduate. If you, are there, if, you went, are there, if you went through the whole program successfully. Right. Are, are there, uh, do, do they know how many people was in the first graduating class? Some the of the class, noted names and that kind of thing? First, the first graduating class uh, all the way through successfully were only four pilots. Uh, the two most well-known names would have been uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Heard of him. Who, who later became the commanding officer of the, uh, he was a West Point graduate. Right. And he later became the commanding officer of the Tuskegee Airmen overseas. And um, there was also uh, Spanky Roberts and he later took over for uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. as the commanding officer of the uh, 332nd. Once, uh, well, that's a long story, but once B.O. Davis was called back stateside to take over the uh, bombing, the bomber uh, unit that was being trained of Tuskegee Airmen in Michigan, in Indiana. Uh, then Spanky Roberts became the commanding officer okay. in Italy. As, as, as we kind of move along here, so to speak, when, um, uh, how, what was, yeah, it, how did um, that transition go to them seeing combat and whatnot? Or what did they do in the beginning? The first few, the first two groups of Tuskegee Airmen had been trained and ready to go a full unit uh, for about a year before they got sent overseas. And initially they were sent to North Africa uh, and basically they were doing, they were flying air support. They were bombing uh, ground targets, you know, strafing uh, enemy positions, that sort of thing. Basically, the things that fighter pilots hate to do the most is what they were doing or originally. Uh, but eventually, after the battle at Anzio in, uh, in Italy, Anzio Beach, 
where even though their planes were about 80 miles per hour slower than what the Germans were flying, uh, they were flying P-40s, so the Germans were, were flying more advanced planes. But despite that, the Tuskegee Airmen within two days of fighting were able to shoot down 13 enemy aircraft. Um, and because before that, there had been an effort by some to pull the Tuskegee Airmen out of combat and, uh, and uh, send them back home. Because they were doing too good. <laughs> there was a white commander, Spike Momeyer, had tried to uh, have the Tuskegee Airmen taken out of combat he claimed they showed a lack of aggressive spirit. Uh, basically, he was calling them cowards. <laughs> but after they uh, showed what they could do at Anzio Beach, that kind of shut up that talk, so to speak. Okay. But, <laughs> uh, but, even before, but even before the Battle of Anzio Beach, uh, General, well, not General, Colonel Davis was called back to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis at the time, was called back to have to uh, speak up for or uh, defend his unit, uh, which he did before a, uh, a military body. And we basically said, you know, that they were doing as good a job as anybody else flying the same type of aircraft. And when they did the, and they did a study to see whether that was true. And when they did the study and found that yeah, the Tuskegee Airmen and their P-40s, which is what they were flying originally, were doing as well or better as every other unit flying P-40s. And then they showed at the Battle of Anzio Beach what they could do. And the talk about them being uh, removed from combat and sent back home ended. Um, okay. And shortly after Anzio Beach, well, actually it was a few years later, they uh, got the bomber escort missions. Uh, the bomber escort missions, uh, bomber escorts that they had used previously before the airmen did not have a very strong record of protection they would get suckered off by uh, the, German the German planes. The Germans would send part of their fighting group down from the clouds to attack the uh, bombers and they would draw the uh, bomber escorts off to chase after them. And when the bomber escorts left to chase after the German fighters, more German fighters came out of the clouds and tore the American planes to to bits. One of the things and one of the reasons why the Tuskegee Airmen was so successful in bomber protection is because uh, Benjamin O. Davis impressed upon them, stay with the bombers. If one of the bombers, which has between 10 and 13 men on it, gets shot down while you go chasing after glory by, you know, chasing after German fighters, and it and the plane you're supposed to be protecting gets shot down, either you get shot down with it, or don't come back here. Mm. And so, okay, they didn't want to uh, <laughs> to okay. go against uh, Colonel uh, Davis, so they stuck with the bombers. Uh, so it's not true that they did never lost the bomber, but oh over 179 missions, they lost about 27 bombers. Okay. Which is about uh, half of what was the usual. Most bomber escorts lost between 50 and 60 uh, bombers. Oh, really? And Tuskegee Airmen lost about 27. Uh, now, not, let, let me all uh, di divert in this regard. When, when we talk about Tuskegee Airmen and, you know, we recognize these guys that are still alive, what have you, mm -hmm. not all of them flew planes. There were a lot of other assignments right. for them. That's right. Um, Such as? You had only 992 pilots 
15,000 support personnel. Those are both men and women, both black and white, because the instructors are considered Tuskegee Airmen too. Um, so you had parachute riggers, most of whom were women, and those, those were civilians here uh, in the United States uh, at Moton Field or at uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield. You also had uh, nurses, uh, you had clerks, right. you had uh, radio operators, you had armorers, doctors, dentists. Uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield was like its own little town. People always think of the pilots first because of course the pilots get the glory. Right. But if you didn't have all the support personnel, uh, the planes aren't getting off the ground. You also right. had meteorologists. Right. The first African American meteorologists were Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, wow. Now, the meteorologists uh, who worked for the Tuskegee Airmen had degrees in other in other types of science. Some of them had degrees in chemistry or physics or some other scientific right. degree. And then once they graduated, they were trained as meteorologists by the army because you, you need a meteorologist to tell you what the uh, weather conditions were, whether it was good conditions for flying or not. Right. Whether it was gonna be good, good conditions for a bombing mission. Okay, so I guess what you're saying to us is you could be a Tuskegee Airman, but not be in Tuskegee. You could be a Tuskegee Airman and not be at Tuskegee, though most of them were initially trained in Tuskegee. I got you, I got you. Came through trust, they came through Tuskegee even if they got sent elsewhere. I got you, I got you. Know. you. But if you were pilots, uh, pilots came through Tuskegee. Uh, if you were mechanics, some of the mechanics were trained originally at uh, uh, Chanute uh, Army Airfield, and that was in uh, Illinois. Okay. Uh, near Chanute, Illinois. They got trained first because you need the support staff before you need the pilots. Okay. Uh, if you don't have the mechanics to fix the plane, that plane ain't going nowhere. I got you. So uh, the original uh, mechanics and clerks were trained at Chanute in uh, in Illinois. Okay. And then after that, that after that group was trained and came to Tuskegee, they and the and those that came afterwards were trained in Tuskegee. Uh, and the pilots were mostly trained in Tuskegee. And is there, the one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a person that is noted as the head man of Tuskegee Airmen? You, you know what I'm saying? Who who ran the whole operations? So Colonel Parrish uh, and many of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, who've been interviewed say what a what a good commander he was and how he was. Uh, instrumental in making the program successful okay. back in the early days. Uh, now he was overall commander here in Tuskegee over the training. Once they got overseas, the commanding officer overall was uh, uh, Colonel Davis. No, oh, I love it. Let me ask you this, uh, you know, we got to throw some shade on it. I think mm -hmm. you did a little bit. Did they do something other than the one guy hoping that it would fail? Did they give them like inferior uh, airplanes, inferior clothes? Uh, it was the same in terms of the quality. It was the same as the rest of the, okay. the rest of the Army Air Corps guy. Okay. Now the planes they were flying originally in their first missions, the P-40s, they were slower and uh, a bit more obsolete than some of what the Germans were flying. All right, I got but there you. were other P-40 units. They weren't the only P-40 unit. I got you. It took a while for America to really get the hang of how to, how to make a fighter aircraft. This was kind of like the new thing for us. Um, like we didn't have a separate air force. Uh, France and Britain and Germany for that matter and Italy had separate air forces. Okay. Our Air Force was connected to the Army. Okay. So you had a group that's whose primary focus is ground 
uh, combat, also in charge of a unit whose primary focus is air combat. Okay. So trying to get those two things to uh, to mesh took some doing. I got you. It took some time. Eventually, once they built the P-51 Mustang uh, and gave it the uh, British supplied Spitfire engine from uh, the Rolls-Royce company, that's what really opened up air, air to air combat. Okay. It, it was a much superior aircraft to pretty much everything that was being flown except for the German jets. And even though it wasn't as fast as the German jets, the German jets were about 100 miles an hour faster, they were still much more maneuverable than the jets were. Okay. The, I love the it. early jets had good, you know, straight line speed. But they couldn't like make quick turns. And, oh, I got you. And then had the kind of maneuverability as planes like the P fifty one Mustang had. What is the? Um, how did they get the term red tail? Did they actually? They did they only themselves paint a red tail on on the plane? No, um, actually, all the fighter escort units had uh, markings on their tails. Some of them had uh, red tails, which Tuskegee Airmen had, uh, and they were the only ones that had the red tails. Some of them had yellow and black uh, stripes or checkers, checkerboard pattern. Okay. Or some other, or black and white or black and yellow or something like that. That was for identification. Okay. So that when you came to escort the bomber, they'd know what unit it was. I got you. Now, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, the color that was chosen for them was red. I got you. And yellow uh, for the uh, the tail and red for the tail and, and red and yellow for the nose um, and red tip wings. But it just so happened that those colors were close to the colors that uh, the Tuskegee Institute colors. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Our, our colors are crimson and old gold. Okay. So, I know, love it. Foot in, in terms of, you know, our sports teams and such. And uh, the colors for the Tuskegee Airmen on their planes was red and yellow. I got you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if one had anything to do with the other. It was just right. happenstance. Right. But uh, all, of the, all of the fighter units had identifying markets on the tails. As we, was, and, maybe just a couple more questions. Okay, and, and one more thing. It was the oh, bombers. Yeah, it was the bombers who gave them the nickname Red Tail Angels. Oh, really? Because after a while, it became clear that if you're escorted by these Red Tail pilots, you had a higher survival rate. You were less likely to get shot out shot out of the sky you were more likely to get home to your family okay so they started requesting the red tails to uh be the ones to give them bomber escort in fact it got to the point that uh colonel davis painted the side of his plane you know most of the pilots had various names for their planes like they might name it after their wife or a girlfriend or parent or something like that. Colonel Davis named his plane by request because all of the uh, all of these fighter escort, I mean, all of these bombers were requesting them for escort duty because they had a higher survival rate if the if the red tails were the ones escorting your bomber. I got you. I love it. Let me let me ask you this question. Did they did they have bombs on their planes or did they have guns that they could shoot other planes yes. down? They had they had uh machine guns on the uh in, in the wing and they also had bombs that was that was sometimes uh on the wing of the plane. Okay. They did more than bomber escort. 
they also did some bomb bombing of low level targets themselves. Okay. Um, so depending on what the mission was, it, it would depend on how your plane was outfitted. Um, they also had external fuel tanks on the outside of the wing to increase the range of the aircraft. Now, once you got into air-to-air -air combat, you had to do what they call drop tanks. Otherwise, you have this huge uh, canister of uh, gives the enemy something they can shoot at and make your plane blow up. So I got you. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I understand so they, that. So once you got into combat, they did what you call drop tanks, and they dropped the tank and got you know. It also made the plane more aerodynamic. Yeah, I got you. To not have this. How how long did the Tuskegee Airmen troop last? It started in it started, one year, and it probably lasted till when? It started in uh, 1941. Uh, that's when the training initially started. Right. And as far as training at Tuskegee, at Moton Field, that ended in 1946. But you still had some Tuskegee Airmen at, at Chanute Army Airfield later Chanute Arm later Chanute Air Force Base in, in Ohio. They existed as a unit until about 1948-49. So so what we're saying is the Tuskegee Airmen really was a five year run. Yep. Oh my God. Is there though, is it though they did still exist until about 1948. Yeah, right. Because you had the, this one airfield in uh, Ohio, Lockridge which was uh, run by Colonel Davis. It was almost a completely, it was a completely African-American airfield uh, okay. in the United States. It had, uh, this was before President Truman signed the executive order desegregating uh, the I, military. I got you. And the first uh, unit to be desegregated was the Air Force because it was the newest service. Uh, the Air Force came about in '48. And, oh, I love uh, it. So, uh, I'll make one, one, two more questions. What is, um, is there a, a, an event, a holiday, or, or something that they celebrate on t for the Tuskegee Airmen in particular? We have uh, two things. We have usually around Memorial Day, at least prior to COVID, we have what we call Memorial Day fly-in. Uh, and it was a few years ago now since, you know, we've had COVID for the last few years. Yeah. <laughs> but usually we would get some Tuskegee Airmen who would show up uh, and uh, we'd have various airplanes that would fly in to Moton Field because in, at Moton Field, um, separated by a chain link fence on what side of the fence it's the the airport uh that's now owned by the city right uh it was paved in the 60s but that's the original field when it was dirt and grass where the tuskegee airmen would have been taken off and landing oh okay for training uh they paved it in the 1960s when it became the uh, municipal airport for the city of Tuskegee. Uh, and on the other side of the fence, on the right side of the fence, is the uh, National Historic Site. And that's where we have the historic buildings and, uh, and the displays where you could come in and listen to oral histories from the airmen. One of the first things we did once we got the okay to become a national park is to start interviewing as many Tuskegee Airmen as we could and their families because, you know, we knew with the advanced age. Right. You know, there now, as far as we know, about five pilots left. We're not sure how many uh, support staff are still alive. Right. But it's probably in the double digits. Right. It was funny. I had a movie showing in uh, Cincinnati and a mm -hmm. guy shows up and said he was a Tuskegee Airman. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and that, that and he he probably was 80 something 90 even at that point but he was yeah. in amazing health and uh we in here in detroit had a tuskegee airmen museum mm-hmm. and, yeah. and, and 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 they that's, still honor tuskegee airmen yeah, that, and, that was because of selfridge field that's where they were initially training the bomber oh uh, really yeah because you know coleman young was a tuskegee airman. that's that's what i was getting ready to say that right yeah mm-hmm. right and so what's, what's see again face, I'm there I'm now the <laughs> at, at the at the park that you work at is the is the building that was once what? And this is where you can take tours and you can walk the grounds even. You can walk the grounds. We have one of the original hangars is still existing. Okay. That's hangar number one. Hangar number two is a reconstruction. Um the original hangar two, when it when the, the land was still owned by the institute. There was a fire uh, which destroyed most of Hangar 2, except for the control tower in the back. Um, But we reconstructed it from the outside. It looks like it would have back then. One advantage of it having uh, to be reconstructed, though, is it it caused us to, when we rebuilt it, to do a completely modern museum on the inside of Hangar 2. Okay. So we have... uh, audiovisual displays where you can uh where we have like four sections who were the Tuskegee Airmen and uh we have two sections on uh the double V campaign okay which was victory abroad against fascism victory at home against racism okay and in each of those sections you go in and you hit the touch screen and you can hear directly from the airmen Okay. themselves on video interviews talking about their experiences both in this country during training and also uh, overseas. Uh, we also have an area there where they, one of the videos talks about some of the Tuskegee Airmen who were taking prisoners of war. Uh, we have another uh, section under the double V where they talk about uh, the black press and how influential they were and they talk about what it was like when they came back to the United States and still faced racism at home. Yeah, right. And then the last section is on the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen. Right. Where it's interviews with uh, various people uh, who were influenced by what the Tuskegee Airmen did. Right. And in that section, we also have a photograph uh, on the on the screen behind uh, of President Obama's inauguration, where you, you know, yet he, right. he uh, invited several of Tuskegee Airmen to come and right. be guests of his uh, inauguration. The, 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 I guess my last question is this, my brother: Is there uh, some accommodation or something like that that the Tuskegee Airmen unit as a whole received? Uh, some kind of honor that was long over, you know what I'm saying? Was long overdue. Yeah. They didn't want to give it to him. I don't know, whatever, whatever. And then one there day were something two, happened. Two distinguished unit citations that they received during the war. Uh, there was, of course, Congressional Gold Medal that they got during the Bush administration. Okay. The second Bush administration. Uh, and uh, we have three three of the Congressional Gold Medals on display. Um, okay, I love it. Yeah. Man, I love it. Hey, everybody, I told you, <laughs> <about me. laughs> Oh, my God. And, 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 because we, you know, we know about them. We hear about them. Uh, but that's the real story right there. He told it. Right. Uh, the, the real deal of the Tuskegee Airmen. I love it, man. Thank you for coming on the channel, everybody. No problem. No problem. You see what we do here is strong inspirations. We're going to cover it all you in should've. some form or fashion <laughs> and give it to you straight. No chaser. I'm telling you here at Strong Inspirations. Uh, hit the subscribe button on the channel. I know you want to. You're thinking about it. You yeah. hesitate. And some of you all have. I thank those who have. Those hesitant people, I thank you for hesitating because you're getting closer and it's just a matter of time. Uh, those who don't even want to, I thank you because you're going to come around. I, I ain't no question. 
and and like this video my man told us some things we don't know uh hit the bell when the videos come up you get a ding a shock or something that lets you know that boom it's on strong inspirations and then tell somebody about us watch my movie read my book go down there to his site check that out that's something y'all can do because it's open yeah, okay, now i'm sure right then on the weekends now yeah uh, friday and saturday Yep, go down there to Tuskegee and then you can walk that campus. You see this brother right here. He going to greet you uh, and, 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 and with that hospitality that he got in his heart and tell it to you straight, no chaser. Tell him you saw him on Strong Inspirations. And um, to you, my brother, I say this with all sincerity. Stay strong. Stay safe. Stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, man. You Thank keeping you. it alive. <laughs> oh my God, that's a beautiful thing. Keep it going. You are you you one of them uh one of them leaders in that community, man. You walk down the street, they go say, hey, my man, look at my man in the in the uniform. He holding it down <laughs> up here for us. That's what he's doing. This is his life's calling. Keep that yeah. going. Stay strong, stay safe in that regard. And to everybody, I say bye-bye. We out. <laughs>